Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Neil Haley Show. And, you know, we've been continuing to cover all these comeback, the untold story, because it's just an amazing story, in my opinion, of a time. And the story just really not been told like this documentary is. So I'm excited to welcome another person from the movie, uh, the documentary, ID Uyo. ID, thanks for stopping by the Neil Haley Show. How are you? Uh, thanks, Neil. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Let's learn about your background before we get into why you got involved in the film. Yeah, so my background is actually in technology. I spent about 12 years right out of college, right out of undergrad, uh, working in the technology sector for a big tech company. I worked at IBM and most of the, some of the projects that I had were always sports related, whether I was working with the Olympics in Atlanta or Nagano or places like that. And so I have always been a sports person, true and true. So though my career was in technology, I have always been around sports, whether it is in official capacity, unofficial capacity, or whether it's in sports business development, sales, marketing, what have you. And so I left IBM. I started my own software design firm, worked there for about six years. And one of the projects we worked on was the FIFA World Cup in South Africa in 2010. And I got a chance to see up close just how brands uh, marketed sports, uh, whether it was Adidas, Coca-Cola, and what have you. So I decided to transition. I sold my company and I went back to school, picked up a master's in Northwestern University. And since then, I have been working as a sports marketer, sports consultant, wow. historian, and uh, what have you. So currently right now we're consulting for national Olympic committees around the world where we assist them with marketing, branding, content development, business development, sponsorship, and those types of activities. So you're gonna be busy soon, right? Cause once the, 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 hopefully with meaning COVID lifting and the, the possibilities of the Olympics still are good shape, not being canceled this summer. Uh, you know, that's they're still trying to work that out. As of right now, today, February 19, 2021, the Olympics are still slated to start for July of this year. Um, of course, you know, with COVID, it's a very fluid situation. We are still working with our clients, other National Olympic committees, as if the games are going to go forward. So we're in full preparation mode already. So how did you get involved in Ali's comeback? Yeah, so... Uh, I think it was back in 2016, uh, Art Jones, who's the director of the film, uh, approached me and through an intermediary, and he had seen some of my work because we, at that point, we'd done content development work, and some of it was around Muhammad Ali and his involvement in the Olympics. And so having met with, all, uh, with Art a couple of times, I needed to really figure out if I was the right person to tell the story, if I was a good fit for the film. So through... Uh, multiple conversations it would just determine that I was and I was brought on to tell the story of Ali between 1967 1970 and even in some ways beyond and how that comeback fight in 1970 helped shape Ali for the rest of his career okay so based on you being a historian is that where you're bringing the knowledge into the help art correct yeah based on my very extensive background in sports history Interesting. But see, when you were at IBM and all that stuff, did you have that sports history background? I did, but I just never pursued it. Oh, yeah. I mean, even. Wow. From, I mean, uh, so I go and I'm going to date myself here way back to 1976 Olympics. My parents, who were teachers, my dad taught at the university, um, always used sports as a teaching tool. So mm -hmm. like in 1976, use the Olympics as a teaching tool. We learned about apartheid and so on. And so, yeah, I've always been neck deep into the backstory of sports and sporting events and historical significance. So what attracts you to Ali? Yeah, so um, Ali himself was probably one of the more polarizing figures of the 20th century. I mean, both in the world, in the realm of sports, in the realm of popular culture and in the realm of politics. And if you consider how volatile the 60s were, particularly in the late 60s and into the 70s, Muhammad Ali was a central theme in that entire story. Whether it was Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 1968 Olympic Games raising the black glove fist, one of their demands was the restoration of Muhammad Ali as the legitimate heavyweight champion of the world or whether it was Ali joining the Nation of Islam, a very controversial move at that time, or whether it was Ali being wow. drafted 
and then refusing uh, to be inducted, despite the fact that he had actually failed the exam, the aptitude exam for the draft two years earlier. So he, they couldn't understand why they had lowered the requirements and then at, tried to draft him again. So Ali has just been one of these figures that has transcended the world of sports. I mean, there was a Cold War element uh, to Ali. There was the political dimension, as I mentioned earlier. So we went from having a sportsman to someone who was perhaps along with Pele, the most recognizable name in all of sports, if not, um, if not the world. Everybody knew who Muhammad Ali was. Yeah, absolutely. I think and you're right, polarizing, but also the fact that he was one of the most charismatic uh, athletes of all time. Muhammad Ali made ABC's Wide World of Sports back in the day with Howard Cosell. I mean, back in those days, the athletes were expected to, quote unquote, shut up and dribble. Ali was never about that. Ali was, but Ali was very outspoken. But for that to happen, Ali needed to be authentic, which those around him say he was. And history actually bears that out with the Cleveland Conference. Uh, where you had Jim Brown, Bill Russell, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, trying to determine whether, this was back in uh, 1968, mm -hmm. trying to determine whether or not they would back Ali's stance against being drafted into the Vietnam War. So um, there are many tentacles that attracted people to Ali as a figure, both those who supported Ali and those who uh, were his detractors, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So that again, the story which Art and I've discussed, and all these different things, you saw this in a historical lens in a different way. What consulting this film, like you knew that the people that were going to be interviewed in it, but you all also understand you wanted to bring your historical perspective of what people that might have had a bias that were interviewed in the movie compared to someone like yourself that looks at the newspaper clippings, both sides of the story. You are trying to be unbiased in this account, then, correct? Yeah, objectivity was very important in terms of telling an authentic story. Um, Muhammad Ali was by no means a saint. But when this happened, you had to consider that there were, there were those around him that were pretty skeptical of his motivations initially. Like, all right, well, why is he doing this? I mean, we haven't heard you talk about uh, being against war previously. And so, you know, you're, now you're coming up with this. Let's, 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 let's dig a little deeper. Let's engage and understand where you're coming from. And of course, he famously said, ain't no Viet Cong ever called me a nigger and things of this nature. So uh, other athletes, people in society were able to rally around him because of that authenticity. And so as an individual, he himself was also able to stand by those principles. And he was able to, in those three years that he was out of boxing, he got a lot of support from other fighters like mm -hmm. Joe Frazier. Uh, provided financial support, believe it or not, and others. Yeah. And so, yeah, and he took out jobs. He spoke at campuses, university campuses across the country. He sang for a moment. He had his own musical group. So he did a lot of things to stay afloat during those, uh, during those three years. But the key thing was he never wavered. In fact, there was an agreement that was brokered through back channel deals between the chairman of the Democratic National Committee and Lyndon Johnson. Oh, wow. And the compromise was, Ali, all you have to do is put on a military uniform and stage boxing exhibitions for U.S. troops in bases in the United States. You don't even need to leave the U.S. Yeah. Just do these boxing exhibitions and this whole case goes away. And he refused to put on the uniform and he rejected the oh, compromise. Oh, no. He, he rejected the compromise. And again, for those who don't know, the backstory of this was... He was drafted. He refused to go into the Vietnam War. He was fined $10,000, sentenced to five years in imprisonment, and his title was stripped away from him. By the WBA version of his title was stripped away from him. So in essence, he couldn't fight. He was... Um, he just couldn't fight because no commission in those days, boxing was sanctioned by the individual boxing commissions of the states. So none of the 50 states would give him a license to fight. Now, there was a deal in Nevada with a gambler known as Jimmy the Greek. People know Jimmy the Greek more for his work on the NFL today. Jimmy the Greek and Bob Arum came up with this scheme where Bob Arum would promote the fight in Las Vegas against Joe Frazier in 1970. Wow. The billionaire Howard Hughes yes. gets wind of this and he tells Governor Nevada Governor Paul Laxalt at the time, you're not going to do this. 
I and mean, Howard Hughes was so powerful that he could, in fact, pick up the phone and call the governor and say, hey, you're not going to do this. Howard Hughes, obviously a very big supporter of the military, you know, Hughes right. aircraft, Hughes this. He said, no, this guy's a draft dodger. You can't let him in. You can't let him fight in Las Vegas. So that nicks that. And of course, that opened the door for Georgia, which did not have a boxing commission at the time. And in that story of Georgia is in itself a story that uh, we went through, right? You know, the whole story of Georgia in general, in the fact of what kind of racial times were there, that's a surprise that that is where all these comeback happens, right? In a lot yeah, of ways. There, in that era, there were deep racial tensions in the Southern US and Atlanta was emerging as the cradle of the civil rights movement with Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King, Andrew Young, Ralph David Abernathy. And these were the men that would lead protests through the South and campaign for civil rights. And so it, Georgia was a very unlikely choice. Senator Leroy Jordan, who'd been the first black senator in the state of Georgia since Reconstruction, so a period of 92 years, led the effort and his team wow. figured out that there was no boxing commission in the state of Georgia. And so along with the Jewish mayor, um, Sam Massell at the time, they were able to make the fight happen, to sanction the fight, primarily because there was no boxing commission to oppose Ali fighting in the state of Georgia. But even then, that was a highly political thing. Massell himself did not, and he was very reluctant to do this. There was quite a bit of pressure on Massell not to allow Ali to fight. But through, again, back channel discussions, uh, they were able to work it out. When you knew you were going to be the historian on this film and you were going to be interviewed as well, did you find out new stuff that you might have not known about that time period when you did your research? Most of the research, I'm um, because you know when you're when you're working with Ali in the sports industry, it's an ongoing. I mean, you never really stop researching, if you will. So most of the from almost all the information I'd known, the only uh, new thing I think that came out uh, when I was working on the film was the resistance, just the level of resistance to the, with the KKK and other organizations wow. within the state of Georgia and Atlanta specifically that were absolutely against the fight. In fact, I tell you something else, in 1996, Ali lit the Olympic, cauldron, the Olympic, the Olympic flame, the cauldron yeah. at the 1996 Olympic games. We remember him standing there shaking with yes. Parkinson's disease while he did it. One of the more iconic moments in Olympic history, that almost didn't happen because the chairman of the Atlanta organizing committee, Billy Payne, who later became chairman of Augusta National, initially when NBC officials approached him with the idea of Ali lighting the Olympic cauldron, he said, no, that where we're from, he's considered oh a draft dodger. You know, so that almost didn't happen, but it was interesting how they were able to work it out and Ali's career would come full circle from resurrecting his career in 1970 to lighting the Olympic cauldron and perhaps one of the most visible events in all of sports. Do you feel Ali ever came back to his prime after uh, choosing to not fight and mean because of his religion and then end up being kicked out of boxing for three years. Do you think he ever got back to his prime that he was before, in your opinion, as a historian? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, prior to that, Ali was unbeaten. Um, of course, Olympic gold medalist, uh, second youngest champion ever to win the heavyweight division. Floyd Patterson was the first. And I think that any time you are off in just about any profession for three years, it does take uh, quite a bit out of you. And he was in his prime years. His comeback fight against Jerry Corey, that, but then March 8, 1971 in Madison Square Garden against Joe Lewis, uh, excuse me, Joe Frazier, he lost. And there are those that suggest that he was not quite informed. But again, it's hard to know, but I would say that when you're off that much for that length of time from just about any profession, let alone one that require, requires physical exertion and with a professional athlete's career is an extremely short window, it certainly takes a lot out of you. But we would also not forget that um, four years later in Kinshasa Zaire, he did beat George Foreman to regain the heavyweight championship of the world. And so, you know, it's kind of hard to say, and he wouldn't lose again until 1978 when he lost to Leon Speaks. You think the stress of that time being off of boxing hurt his health in any way? 
or do you think it was just boxing that hurt his health in certain ways? I don't think his time being off uh, hurt his health. I think that, in fact, his time being off may have in some ways prolonged his career because three years you're not getting hit, right? So that did allow him perhaps to fight perhaps even a little longer than most people think he should have. Should have retired a few years earlier, but, you know, that's, you know, everyone's subject to their own opinion. But no, I don't think the time off hurt him, but I do think, I, I don't think the time off hurt him physically, but I do think that the time off from a boxing perspective um, did in fact truncate his career slightly. So let's look at, you talk about his career and all those different things and all that. What about the interviews of the other athletes and other people? What surprised you the most of the interviews? Because those are historical accounts for people that were there or part of it, were part of Ali's life that maybe you didn't see in reading back in different newspaper articles and different things. The, different magnitude of, the magnitude of the event itself. This was perhaps the biggest sporting event at the time. Um, a very, just the, the, the sheer volume of interest in Muhammad Ali right. as an individual. And to see this type of wealth cut across the boundaries of society, whether it was entertainment, popular culture, politics, sports, music, entertainment, even gangsters, right, descended right. on Atlanta to, to see this. And so as I am doing the research for this, as I am talking to other people within the film, right. and even those that did not make it on screen, the sheer magnitude cannot be understated or even overstated, if you will, as to how significant an event this was because of what was at stake. Either this individual who was considered loud and brash and polarizing, either he would be silenced forever or his career would continue. And there are those that feel that he got a raw deal. And so let's not leave that out either. So um, what I, my big takeaway in doing the research for the film was the fact that uh, just how big, I knew it was a big but how outsized the event was. Right, exactly. And that's things that you don't see. Now, looking at looking back at the whole, you know, the entire film and all of it, what was your take after the documentary came out and you got to view it and watch it? Yeah, no, I was pleased with the uh, I was pleased with the content. I felt that uh, there's a lot of people that worked on the documentary. I mean, Yahya McLean, Doug Bowling, Art Jones, of course, and Dr. Khalil Ali, Ali's ex-wife. Yes. And um Others, so, and then Andrew Young, Dr. Edwin Moses, who was uh, at Morehouse College, um, where Ali actually fought. In fact, the original comeback was supposed to be at Morehouse um, before it was moved to the gym at Georgia State. But just in general, being able to share a platform with Andrew Young, with Jim Brown, the great running back for the Cleveland Browns, and with Dr. Moses, with Evander Holyfield, and just hearing them talk about their perspectives on Muhammad Ali, both, and some of the things obviously didn't make it in the film, some of the rough edits behind the exactly. scenes, but just getting the anecdotes of those, um, of those conversations from the likes of uh, Jim Brown and from Dr. Ali, that was, um, to me, that was quite rewarding. So what's new with you? I mean, you, again, you talk about the Olympic stuff. I, I'm just impressed. I saw your CV or the, thing you sent me and I was blown away with the accolades you've had in sports career and what you've done in sports arenas and stadiums and all this impressive stuff. What's new, what new projects do you have coming up? Yeah. So for me, cup coming to Atlanta in 2026. So trying to figure out how I can add value in that area, continuing to work with clients in the sphere and the realm of the Olympic games but also continuing down this path of continuing to develop documentaries, telling stories, being able to perhaps bring the viewer, the story behind the story of these athletes, of these figures and individuals who sh help shape sports, not just in the past, but setting the trends for where exactly. sports is going. So yeah, telling stories is something I continue to incorporate into my, uh, into my portfolio. Well, it's fantastic, and you're an impressive guy for sure, ID, and I really appreciate this. And so uh, let's go with other sports. What do you say your expertise in sports? Do you cover, Do you like, is a sports historian you big in football? What's your favorite sport that you like to, as a uh, Yeah, well, um, for me, it's, um, I, I don't necessarily know that I, I have a favorite, Neil. I mean, uh, as a storyteller, I am intrigued 
by what motivates athletes, what motivates right. uh, the various brands. Uh, but if I had to say, I love athletics. Of course, it's big during the Olympics. And I'm a big follower of European football, both Liverpool and Real Madrid oh, really? are my teams. Yeah, huge, huge fan of um, the European Football Champions League, uh, Premier League, uh, La Liga. Follow a lot of European football and also the NFL. Curious to see what the NFL is going to do as far as expanding their footprint into other geographies. Exactly. And with COVID, what happens next in this expansion? When you talk about the NFL, when they were going to Europe and all that stuff, and now COVID, how do you think the sports have handled COVID in your opinion? Yeah, so of course it was new across the board. So some sports handled it a little bit better than others. Um, we were able to see though, that in those economies, those countries that had perhaps a better social fabric like Germany, sports was able to come back quicker. So for us in the US, it was, a, it was a slow rollout. We had the NBA bubble that was quite successful, but teams are going to have to reimagine their sports arenas, how they engage with fans and some of the policy changes, not just for fans coming to the stadium, but perhaps uh, what are the boundaries between keeping fans safe and then requiring somebody to have an inoculation or show some kind of a vaccine certificate before, you know, those privacy yeah. sort of things. So sports teams and leagues are going to need to figure out how that is going to work. Personally, I think we're still a year or two away from having full capacity in this country. Now, a place like Australia, where you have stadiums are packed because of how they handled the pandemic as a country. So right. for us... Uh, it's a little bit more challenging. Individual sports leagues, and again, in those places, they have ministries of sports that set policies. Exactly. For us, sports are so much more privatized. So individual leagues, which are not necessarily seen, overseen by government, set policies. So, you know, government has very little influence or control over the sports league. So individually, they've got to set uh, standards, and it's going to be interesting to see how they're going to manage that with sponsorship commitments, marketing, keeping fans safe. Exactly. It's going to be tricky across the board. So uh, we'll see how that works out. But I do think that um, eventually we're going to get back to full sports as we knew them. No, so that's awesome. Again, and best place, uh, first of all, Ollie's comeback, the untold story is available everywhere. You go check it and Google it and you'll find it. And the movie is all the places. But what about for you? Where can we connect with you, Idy? You can find me at Twitter at ID Sports, I D Y S P O R T S. You can check out my YouTube channel, ID Uyo. That's I D Y, and the last name is U Y O E. Um, or you can find ID Sports in a couple of YouTube. So, right now, the best place to connect with me is on Twitter. And very soon, we're going to be amplifying the on our two YouTube channels. All right. Well, fantastic. Love to be in any type of a help in that process when you're building those YouTube channels out and stuff like that. I have a digital marketing tech company, so I'd love to kind of look at what you're doing in any way I can provide any advice or assistance or collaborate. We should definitely do it. So I appreciate you stopping by. Uh, you're welcome, Neil. If I could just say one more thing, I left out the most important thing, which is our website, www.idsports.com, I-D-Y. S P O R T S one word idsports.com. Go check out our work, see what's coming in the future. Would love to engage with fans uh, in your audience. All right. Well, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate it. Welcome, Neil. Thank you. All right. That was the Neil Haley show guys. Take care.